The recording has started. Okay, Randinder. Ah, uh, okay, okay. So good evening, everyone here who is actually either watching me live or it's part of the Google Room class portal. Um, let me tell you a few things before I begin. Um, it's important for me to say this because this is not this is not a very formal talk that I'm doing here because in, in, you know what happens in a formal talk is that we just try to produce a written text from which we start to speak from and then of course it gets limited by 40 minutes or 50, 45 minutes of presentation before long the questions begin and so it's very difficult to keep track of the person speaking because he or she reads out from a written text sentence after sentence and it's difficult for the for, for, for the for the listener or the viewer to really keep pace with that often and it also happens that uh, sometimes you do have a question in your mind which uh, you don't get a chance to ask so this is not the kind of thing I'm very interested in because um, it's 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 been completely schematized in the form of a class lecture. So I'm going to do this in a kind of a class lecture mode. And um, when it comes to a class lecture mode, there are a few things that I need to share with you because this is the first one of the eight lectures that I have late class lectures that I have envisaged for this entire course. The first thing is that um, uh, this will be very informal in nature, and uh, whatever questions you have, whatever discussion points that you have, whatever queries that come to your mind, intelligent, rigorous, stupid, whatever. It doesn't make any difference to this because it's a classroom. So you can just keep asking me about different things that you can want to think about alongside me at the same time. I would really appreciate if you disagree with me because um, I've always told my students and scholars and my colleagues all the time that disagreement probably and dissent probably is the most important thing in my life because um, I've always been suspicious of admirers. So this is, um, this is something that I would love to, in a sense that you start to discuss things with me and not necessarily all the time disagreeing, but there are certain points that you want to extend with me or want to know more elaborately from my end. I would be ready to do that. Also, there are a few other things before since this is the inaugural mock class lecture. Um, we are going to talk about, we are going to talk about these eight class, uh, eight lecture series, or rather eight classroom lecture series about what is a literary. Now, um, this is a very vague question. I mean, if you ask this, this, this question to anyone for that matter, this actually becomes very vague because uh, when you say what is literary, it can really mean a lot of things. Like it can bring in the concept of the imaginary. It can, it can obviously bring in the concept of how you look at totality. At the same time, you start to see how this whole speciality of formation, speciality in the formation of concepts of paradigms come up. So literary, uh, uh, this is the reason why I chose it, literary can of course trigger a lot of questions in your mind. It just about produces those haunts of confusion, uh, uh, setting on which probably you can start to think with me. Because most importantly uh, for me is, this whole idea of the literary is about critical thinking. I don't know exactly what critical thinking really means because this has been one of my governing concerns of late and certainly something that I'm developing as a project at the same time, even truly into a book. It's where exactly do you think that the creative and the critical comes in? Is it that the literary is creative? Is it that the literary is critical? Or is it that there is nothing called creative and critical there is nothing called uh, critical at all because everything that you do, everything that you think or try to work out becomes creative in nature. Or the opposite can be true. I know of people who absolutely don't believe in anything that is creative because anything that is creative for them would all the time be critical. So this is the, this is the uh, real reason why I actually got this idea of the literary into the classroom for these PhD seminars. And um, another point is that um, uh, people who have who have listened to me in the past, I don't talk much online or I don't lecture in seminars, um, but people who have actually heard me know that my class lectures are not in the role of an explicator. I'm not here to really be a, somebody like a guidebook to you. I will not be giving you an idea that after you leave this class today, uh, you will not going to take your notes, whatever notes you take at whatever discussion points you make. You're not going to go home or take home rather that this is the literary. 
So what I have told you, you just bullet point your understanding or, or, or bullet point your comprehension, and you say that these are the points that comprise or make what you understand with the literary. That is exactly not the way I teach. That is not exactly not the way I write. So what you're going to get here is a very engaging way of looking at the literary, obviously, there are certain crutches, I call them these days, the theoretical or philosophical or, uh, or thinker crutches that on which you probably can rest on, lean on, and try to develop or understand a certain concept. But at the same time, I think there is also the need for you to think tangentially beyond that point. Because unless you start to grow that kind of a mind where you have that tangential way of understanding things and understanding the way the paradigms actually change, with your understanding, you'll never be able to think. Remember that um, uh, when people, when this whole Americanization of uh, understanding and Americanization of writing, it will require that you give a footnote. Every single word that you mention, even if that word is something that you don't know. For instance, you say totality and, uh, and you don't, don't footnote it and somebody can just jump on you and say, oh, that is something that Hegel was talking about. Why didn't you mention phenomenology of spirit there? So, you know, that's the way, that's the kind of framework, that's the kind of an understanding that we have of any kind of a class lecture, any kind of a lecture, any kind of a presentation or a writing. So in this kind of a mode that I'm going to do with you all, it's just not the informality of it, but there'll be lots of things that will keep pouring into the kind of uh, the system of thought that we are going to pr uh, have with in the subsequently in all the lectures that follow this one. And what kind of thinking that would be is that things would come from sciences, things would come from mathematics, things would come from uh, biosemiotics, things would come from the philosophy, things would come from the literature. So there are different kinds of things that would come into this classroom lecture as we progress. And we will see how and what connects you. Is there something, because, you know, sometimes it does happen, uh, I, 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 I should really interrupt myself to say this, that if one is actually talking about Hegel, for instance, who will, of course, come in our classroom talk, Subsequently, uh, when we start to talk about Hegel, then there might be people who are not interested in Hegel. I mean, how is it important that you have to know your Hegel to understand literature or understand critical thinking? You might not be interested in that. I, I fear enough, I take that. But, you know, in a classroom lecture that I envisage, or the kind of things that I want to do with my colleagues, with my scholars, with my students, is that there will be lots of things coming into because um, I am actually somebody who. Um, I would say a very non-specialist generalist. Um, I don't know what that means, but you can frame your own ideas. A non-specialist generalist. So there are lots of things that from different disciplines that I study that I want to get into my writing and thinking will actually start to pour into this virtual classroom. And then what happens is that you might just take home some pointer idea that you think connects with you, that you think might be used, might be might be elaborated, extended as you move ahead with your work or move ahead with your critical discourse. So this is the, 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 the second part of it. And the third part would be that whenever questions you have, uh, uh, just, just note your questions down, whatever discussion points that you would like to have, you note them down. And uh, the best would be probably if you can get in touch with me after I finish. Um, so it might be a sort of a one and a half hour that I'm going to talk now. And then, of course, I'm going to, I'm going to take all your questions, whatever be its nature, just free to ask me. Because I certainly believe that um, questions cannot have character. Questions cannot have class. Questions are questions. And it is probably the answers which will have class and character. So you are free to ask questions of very nature, unstriped, un, un, unformalized, unformatted questions that you can keep asking me once this lecture is over. So coming to, uh, coming to this point about the literary, um, I would begin with my re reading of the literary. Because when I begin with my understanding of the literary, there would be other thinkers, our thoughts that are going to come into our discussion. And then, of course, we would start to elaborate those thinkers and see how I'm looking at this whole idea of the literary. I have a very 
um, a different position about looking at this literary. I would say different because I don't believe in the idea of originality. I, I, I always consider if someone is original, then someone is different. So that would be a kind of a different way of looking at the literary. So let me see how I can do that. And I will base my uh, discussion today with you uh, on my very recently published book. I mean, just published last year, and here is the book for you. And uh, it is the called Trans Infusion. And it's, it's in reflections on the critical thinking. Uh, surely when I wrote this book, I thought that there could be a critical thinking. But gradually, as I can see myself in a the, in the couple of years time, probably I would be trying to get rid of this word creative and critical and trying to come up with a different kind of an idea and a theory and philosophy about it. But for the moment, uh, this is a book which I'm going to focus on and explain certain points, certain, certain possessions, which I thought was very different in the formation of the literary for you all, and see how we respond to the idea of the literary, because that's where I'm going to begin. Things can be a little complicated at times because, um, uh, uh, because, because, because it's transdisciplinary, because there are lots of other things that come into play, which you might not be trained. Some of you are, might not be trained in mathematics or sciences or biosciences. So those things might come in, but I will try to make it as comprehensive as possible because this is the classroom lecture. And as I said, I'm not reading from a text at all. So all discussion points that you are going to jot down, come back with me once I finish talking. So let us come to this uh, first part about uh, what is the what is my idea of the literary? Let us, let us let us not say what is literary. Now, when you say what is literary, you put an interrogation to that. And this interrogation is something that starts to investigate what the word literary means. But the problem is that the more you try to round the circle, you end up with edges. This is the, this is the very interesting part about critical thinking. The more you try to, the more you try to find a balanced equation, uh, trying to, in a way, balance out the left with the right, there is always a kind of a surplus that extends either on the left and the right hand side, most often on the right hand side. So, you know, this is where the theorization, the mathematicization of critical thinking is at times impossible. I'm not saying it's not possible. There are certain ideas that you can certainly clearly delineate and explain, but most often it happens, as I said, that you are heavily engaged in rounding the circle and most of them you're not happy about the edges. So it is on these edges that we actually survive. It is on these edges that we actually inhabit. Let me um, uh, begin with this uh, idea of what, how do I see literary? You might not see literary the way I am seeing at this moment, but this, there, is, there, is, there should always be a home, there is always should be a stretch where we can just come together and see whether we can have a kind of a struggle to understand a certain concept. Now, one thing that I felt that the literary can probably do is when I started to think about the idea of the aesthetic imaginary. Now, um, let me tell you um, that when I started to think about aesthetic imaginary, this was a term that I coined uh, way back, probably three years ago, when I coined this term, because I was interested in the imaginary studies domain and reading, reading of course, primarily on Lacan and Irigaray and the Greek philosopher Castoriadis, and obviously Hegel and um, other Western thinkers. And, and, and I was trying to see that how this whole concept of the imaginary, whether it's the psychological imaginary, whether it's the imaginary as the non-conscious, or whether the, the, the radical imaginary of Gastriotis, all these, uh, where does it lead us to? Where, are, where do these concepts lead us to? And then obviously I started to think that whether there can be a word or there can be a concept called aesthetic imaginary. Now, very quickly, let me put this um, to you because uh, there, are, there are two words that come in. As I said, this is a class lecture. So everything I'll explain to you and try to see whether you can connect with me. This is not a talk. Um, when you say aesthetic, what does this mean? What actually does aesthetic mean? It's very important. Now, when you talk about aesthetics, remember that you are trying to figure things out. You are trying to systematize things out. There is a kind of a principled way of understanding something. So if you say that this particular room has an aesthetic of its own, then you are trying to look at structure. 
Now, you, you, you definitely want a structure. So you are actually trying to, in a way, round off the edges, as I said. You are trying to just about, just about smoothen off the edges so that you get a structure in place for your understanding. So aestheticization would, uh, just, just for the moment, leave aside beautification. Aestheticization is all about how you actually start to, how you actually begin to produce a kind of a structure. That is what aesthetic really means. Now, when you come to imaginary, then of course, the, it is both a kind of a concept which talks about how you imagine things, what are the images that come through your imagination. At the same time, it's a container. It's a receptacle. Now, when all these things come together, it becomes a sort of a um, it, it, it becomes a sort of a receptacle which uh, has different kinds of things in it, different kinds of objects in it, different kinds of contrary forces to it, and the antinomiality, the kind of the kind of opposition that this imaginary produces is interesting. When you say the the, the conscious unconscious imaginary, when you say radical imaginary, when you say psychological or feminist imaginary, even when you start to talk about um, I, I, I would even say that uh, Timothy Morton's hyper object would be a kind of an imaginary as well if just one starts to think about it. But when you say aesthetic imaginary, you know, there are structures within structures. I, 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 I must uh, interrupt here to begin uh, to say that uh, I, I, I was enamored by this whole structuralism when I began 20 years ago, thinking that I would be reading and writing on this. But, you know, of late, um, of the last five or six years, or probably seven or eight years now, uh, I, I think this is, this is the, the whole idea of post-structuralism is seriously something that has its own faults. Um, it, is, it, is, it is definitely post-structuralism or this whole idea of trying to break down structures and have a kind of eluvedness about it or a kind of looseness about it is something that doesn't hold up for me anymore. I think what what I what I would like to say, and that is something that we will pick up later when I talk about plastic imaginary, as you very much expect that I'm going to talk about that in, in, in one of my class lectures, and then I start to engage with Malibu, Catherine Malibu, and Hegel, of course. Uh, that would be later, but when one comes to do even plasticity, for that matter, even if, in, even if you start to use the word plasticity and say that, uh, different kinds of domains can be explored, different kinds of frontiers can be pushed, and a different kinds of figurations or configurations or refigurations can be made. You always should remember that there is a structure, something that I would hold on to that position, although I'm very ready to take on people who don't believe in that position. But there is always a kind of structure that you are uh, uh, all the time, all the time showing your allegiance to, which of course is the thesis that I have about structure plasticity. Now, this is important that in an aesthetic imaginary there would be structures, one structure in a way enfolding the other. It's it's it might be delusion, but also in a sense that it might be additive in nature, it might be calculative in nature, it might be uh, uh, arithmetical in nature. Um, it can also be like the way you start to talk about the word calculus, which actually means pebbles. Um, when you're putting one pebble into the other, I mean, like that you have a pitcher and you're putting one pebble into the pitcher. So you are actually putting a kind of calculative way of seeing how the pitcher has been filled by the pebbles and after a point of time, you lose count of that. So one, you do that is that you start counting the pebbles first when you put into the pitcher. That's number one. And when you start to put the pebbles in and after a point of time, you lose count of it. That's the second uh, uh, the object that happens, or the rather second event that happens. And the third one is that you cannot discount that there are pebbles in the picture. So, you know, it is about first the counting, and then the uncounting, and then the discounting. So first you count, and then you know that there is a structure. Then suddenly after a point of time, and that is how thinking really progresses, that is how the literary really starts to come to you, where you start to lose the structure. You don't know where actually the structures are, where are the ends that you need to tie up, how would the doodle game be played where you start to figure out a diagram or figure out a portrait. That's the second part. But then the third part is that you cannot discount anything in spite of the fact that you have actually got into an event of encounter. So you know, this is this is how all kinds of thinking progresses. This is how Actually, when you look at any kind of a literary or any kind of an imaginary, this is how it goes. This is my way of looking at it where you see the counting, the uncounting, and then discounting all coming together to really share a space and produce its own dynamics. Now, 
Aesthetic imaginary then is a complicated phenomenon. Because it's a complicated phenomenon because it starts to bring in different kinds of ideas and different kinds of paradigms within a certain receptacle. Some may have form, some may be formless, some may be forming, some are transformative, some are meta metamorphic. So, you know, all these different states of events start to happen within the aesthetic imaginary. How transfer that to cultural studies for that matter? Just to see how this idea can be used for cultural studies. For instance, if you if you are looking at identity or if you're looking at the whole idea of cosmopolitanism, it is very much a part of the aesthetic imaginary that I'm proposing here. Because once you once you start to talk about, say, um, cosmopolitanism, then you come up with all those uh, ideas that I'm not getting into, those uh, rooted and unrooted, bounded, unbounded, the Kantian, the Apayan, all kinds of things that you bring into your cosmopolitanism. I'm not getting to that because that's not a, a part of the classical lecture today. But what, what I'm trying to say is that this idea of trying to, trying to get this counting, this uncounting, and the discounting paradigm into the understanding of cultural studies. And hence, how this cosmopolitanism or secularism or syncreticism or different kinds of ideas that you bring into your understanding of the world around, even violence for that matter, uh, would all the time have its own aesthetic imaginary. So is it that, is it that uh, violence, uh, secularism, um, contemporary political thinking, extremism, maybe totalitarianism. Uh, do you think all these are part of the literary? They are. These are these. This this is a different sort of the literary that we are. Because you know the the common the common lapse that probably will have that when we use the word literary, this is where I just want to take you away a little. Again, I said you might disagree, but I'm going to take you away from that. That if one actually looks at the word literary, then the, the whole body about the literariness, the literature comes to your mind. But this is where I'm just going to unhinge this concept here for you all. Um, it, is, it is obviously important that you look at the literary from the aspect of literature, the literary studies, theories of literature. But at the same time, the unhinging part is also important where you start to, in a way, unveil the concept in a different mode, in a different way. And it is then what the word literary starts to have its own circulation and momentum. One thing um, that I would, uh, I would very much like to tell you all here is that the literary the literary is is a dynamic the literary is a kind of a it's 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 a kind of a structure which has its own modes of expression which you can relate to everything like um a little controversially but yes i would love to get into that area to say this literary can be of course important for your dna studies literary literary can be genomic in nature, it can be genetic in nature, it can be the whole idea of the mathematical constant, or it can say the kind of a random or chance that comes into mathematical thinking. Literary can also be a way of looking at the whole dialectic that one sees between secularism and the secular. Literary can also be how you look at the whole understanding of the alterity and ethical imagination. Literary can also be the way um, uh, probably Hegel looks at his idea of the supersession of cells or or the plasticity of cells or literary can also be also to draw its part from the idea of Heidegger's does not. So, you know, it's it has a kind of a for me, it has a kind of a dynamic that has structure, that has looseness, um, that also has a kind of emotion that would also have a sort of rigidity, it would have an identity, it would at the same time be an identity in process. So uh, on that note, that somehow I would, uh, somehow that I've got it, got you into this idea, and now you exactly know, or to some point you know that where are the anchors that you need to drop when you want, want when you are looking at the literary. Uh, let me let me come to certain ideas that I want to share with you today, and I try to help you to see uh, through my understanding that where are where what, what are the areas or what are the different kinds of things that one can get to see when the literary is here. 
how do you look at the literary for that matter? Uh, the first thing that for me, the literary as a concept or the literary as a foundation, literary as a dynamic comes through the word opposite. Now, how do you see opposite? And uh, what are the ways by which you see opposite? Because um, opposite is like, this is a difficulty, you know, when you're taking a classroom lecture, you need a blackboard. And I'm a very blackboard person, uh, believe me. I uh, Students know that I really use a, a lot of blackboard because unless I use that, I cannot explain this, the intricacies and complications of these concepts. But I'll try to, and I'll try to see whether you can follow me. If you don't, please just pop your message there so that I can come back to that later. Um, the whole part about is that the opposite. If you're looking at opposite, what is opposite? Now, uh, uh, if you're looking at this, as you can see me, uh, uh, my left hand is just opposite my right hand at this moment. But is this opposite? Probably yes, because here is the opposite. Is this opposite? Yes. Is this the opposite? Probably yes. And is this the opposite? Probably yes. Because if this is the part that stays fixed, then this movement of the other paradigm, wherever the thing goes, does it create any kind of opposite? Now, it does. The real problem about your geometric thinking is that if I say, where is my house? And I tell you, I can look at your house. Have you reached a Christian church? That's where my house is. Just opposite the Christian church. So if it's opposite the Christian church, you will not be going to the backyard of the Christian church. You will stand in front of the Christian church and look at the opposite. So that's a geometric way of actually thinking that this is how the opposite works. But here, point is very interesting. Opposite will all the time have within it two things. One is that it will have this, this seeds of opposition to it. There is anything that you consider is opposite it has an opposition to it. And at the same time, it would also judge whether it is opposite or non-opposite. When you say opposite, that's the appropriateness. So it will also judge whether there is the opposite or whether it's non-opposite. So the point is that there are two things that are coming into the idea of the opposite. The first is it's in opposition, that you're in opposition to something. There is a kind of an there is a kind of an effort on your part to oppose something, to 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 deny something, to have a disclaiming attitude towards something, a kind of a denouncing of what is there for you. That's something that should be there in the word opposite or in the concept of the opposite. At the same time, whether the denouncing or the disclaiming is appropriate, non-appropriate, semi-appropriate, demi-appropriate, that's a para-appropriate. These are the things that start to come in in the whole discussion. So the geometric way of thinking opposite, that's, that's the point I was trying to tell you. The geometric way of thinking opposite doesn't exist yet. For me here, this is the first, the first integral concept of the literary, where once you frame a literary, you start to move into the whole dynamics of the opposite. In it. So anything that happens, say, for instance, is the local, is the local, the, uh, the literary, if you say yes, you would immediately say, that where, which is the local, which one would be the local, one that is closest to my body, one that is closest to my situation, one that is closest to my existence, is that the local or is it that uh, everything about India is local and everything about the US is the global? I mean, how would you like to see the local and the global? Is it that the, the, what you see as the US or the non-Indian part as the global, is it the opposite to the Indian part that is the local? Or where do you see the local in different kinds of layers of understanding as you try to understand the concept? So what happens is the very word local is opposite to its locality. The very word local is opposite to its localness. This very word opposite is, or rather, sorry, the, the word local is opposite to its very local understanding of things. So if the word local is opposite to localness and locality, then the interesting thing is local is all the time self-oppositional in nature. That is, you don't have to bother much about seeing um, 
you don't really have to bother much about, uh, uh, oh, this is local, so the opposite would be global. Or there is a global, so the opposite would be local. That's what I'm challenging here. That's what I'm not asking you to uh, 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 actually understand. The point. My point, of, obviously, of course, uh, subject to your disagreement. But I'm not telling that there's a local so opposite is the global. What I'm saying, the local is by itself its own opposite. There is a kind of self-opposition in the very word local, which is why, you know, uh, why I'm saying this, because um, um, I, I, I think this is, this is in a way, uh, connects me better with this French thinker, Michel Serre. And Michel says the very idea of the powerful local and the kind of lamellar flow that this local can produce in the understanding of the global. And the, 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 very, the very undifferentiated understanding of the local and global is something that I've always challenged through my writings and something I'm still challenging at this moment. And I'm just, just very interested to see that this very idea of the literary then, I was just giving you the instance of the local here, the very idea of that literary then is ingrained, is embedded in the term opposite. So we begin with this idea of the opposition, but uh, I remember something that this opposition um, is a little romantic in nature as well, in a sense that uh, if you go back to Samuel Coleridge's writings, uh, Coleridge uh, talks about this opposite, and all romantic thinking, for that matter, is very oppositional, antinomial in nature. And uh, uh, I remember that uh, romantic thinking, when you basically talk about the secondary imagination, the secondary imagination primarily, fundamentally, is extremely uh, oppositional in nature because you start to bring in different things into the understanding of a certain idea. I mean, and this, this, this very idea of the secondary imagination would be, for me, uh, a, kind of, a kind of an counting and uncounting of things coming together to produce an idea. Like, um, uh, if one looks at a classical imagination or neoclassical imagination, there is very much a sort of a formulaic understanding of things, a kind of a paradigmatic, a kind of a structural understanding of things. But when it comes to the romantics, there is this opposite forces. There are this oppositionalities that start to fill the space that, that you develop to understand a certain thing or your relationship with nature or surroundings. So romantic imagination is something where this, uh, the word opposite comes. But of course, it has its own trajectory to which we are not going at this moment. And uh, uh, certainly uh, uh, one reference that I can give you here is that if you are talking about this opposition from the cold rigid standpoint or the romantic aesthetics, uh, you can also look into this word opposition when you uh, try to understand within this, uh, 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 especially in the last 20 or 25 years where uh, uh, so much of so much of natural sciences have got into your understanding of the literary or understanding of literature or humanities, the idea of superimposition, because um, uh, this superimposition is extremely important where uh, you talk about imposition, when you talk about imposition, then you really talk about someone hegemonizing your position or someone in a way trying to dominate you or in a way trying to influence the way you are thinking. So you say you're being imposed upon in this game. If someone is really something, somebody who is uh, extremely influential or has a lot of impact to really throw about, then that person is impositional in nature. But what is this superimposition? And the superimposition is not about you layering up like a club sandwich where you put putting things up one and the other. That is not the superimposition. The point, uh, the, the point of the matter is that we already are superimposed beings. We already are superimposed consciousness. We already are superimposed literary. The literary is all the time superimposed. You don't need to bring things back into uh, the literary domain and put things one after another. There is all. There has always been the superimposition. And this superimposition that is very much the ontology, very much the essence of how you understand the literary makes it very interesting because this superimposition is not about this additive, qualitative congruity that you see between different paradigms. It is just not about a very calculative, formulaic, structured, prescribed way of looking at things. This superimposition is very oppositional in nature. And, um, not really in the, the in the sense of a Hegelian dialectic here, but uh, uh, but certainly uh, something that I might I will talk later about a negative dialectic here, where you, you start to see the superimposition working 
uh, as a kind of an opposition to the every layer that comes in. We are layered, but we are layered in opposition. We are layered, but we are layered in dissonance. We are layered, but we are layered in disjointed parts. How is that possible? How do you bring that into your understanding of things? That's the kind of um, thing that uh, uh, obviously we will talk about as we go through, but this is the first lecture, so you are just getting a little familiar with the things that will come up later. Now, the uh, 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 the second part of it is that when you bring this literary up, uh, when you start to bring this literary uh, into the opposite, what kind of uh, what kind of opposition that you start to see? Um, say, for instance, um, I will I will I will talk to you here about um, uh, say about let's come to let's come to Jung for that matter. As I said, I will be traveling across discipline, so it's, this, this might be interesting to you. I mean, if, you, if you're looking at Jung for that, and Carl Jung, and you start to see that how Carl Jung does with synchronicity. That is, uh, is there a way of understanding things synchronically, causally? Is there a way of understanding things as it goes from A to B or B to C? Or is it that there is an equality? That is also responsible for our understanding. So, is there a way of looking at synchronicity as an opposite to asynchronicity, or do you think synchronicity is very much a part, a kind of a superimposed dynamic of asynchronicity too? What I try to mean by this complicated explanation is that I don't want to get into complication theories about explication. Remember that. As simple as you can make it, that is what theoretical understanding should be. Uh, it is. What I mean by that is that when you talk about synchronicity, then you see the opposite in asynchronicity. Causality, a causality. My point is very different. I'm not, I'm not looking into this opposite here. As I said, the literary is a kind of a superimposition. Literary is where things are going to fall one with another. If that is what I'm talking about, then is synchronicity also a part of asynchronicity? Or, or if you put it like A in the bracket and then write synchronicity, so asynchronicity hides, conceals within synchronicity. So this kind of an understanding, it makes the whole, the, the whole idea of the literary interesting. For instance, um, say, say for instance, the, the Jung's mode of the psyche. And Jung's mode of the psyche, you know, it's like, um, when you are looking at the psyche, you are looking at a self-regulating system, as I am just going to just read a few things from the book now. It's a self-regulating system that is expected to balance and moderate. But once you bring in this equality into your understanding, the counterbalancing comes. But is it that this counterbalancing is something that is a fresh paradigm that you're bringing in, or is it already very much there? Is it something that is very much within the, the, the causality or synchronicity that you are talking about. So what happens is when one gets into this Jungian paradigm, uh, the idea of the commensurability and incommensurability come into play. Now, how do you look at this? Now, when you say I'm commensurate with your understanding, there is a kind of an understanding of balance, a kind of structure, a kind of a connector, a kind of a nexus. Uh, this is a difficult term, but uh, nexus is, of course, a very, very loaded theoretical term. But I'm using this just, just for the understanding here. This is a kind of a nexus that you start to build with the idea that you're trying to connect with. But when you say commensurate, but Incommensurate would be just the opposite. Incommensurate would be where you fail to connect, where there are disconnectors. There are far more disconnectors than you thought of. So there is a kind of an insurmountability. There is a kind of not being able to understand certain things that connects with or that associates with incommensurability for that matter. But if you ask me, if you ask me which of the term I'm interested in, in framing the literary, then my term would be incommensurability. 
Now, why incommensurability? Why isn't that I'm so interested in not being able to connect with certain things, not actually interested in seeing things getting connected? Isn't that I am somebody who is a secessionist, I'm somebody who is trying to secede from any kind of a commonality, any kind of communality for that matter? It's not that. It is, it is, it is something that I feel that this incommensurability creates a kind of an unease in you. Anything that you try to think, anything try to try to do, the easier you connect, you lose the you you, you lose what I what I call it the, the 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 real literary the restive restless literary in it. Whether it's the a political thought, whether it's a cultural paradigm, whether it's a social thought, the the ease with which you connect would probably actually be a way of how you lose the 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 the, the very the inherent power, the cognitive power of that particular aspect of the particular stretch of thought. Now, what can this incommensurability do is that why it is so powerful and a paradigm for me is that it can create an unease. Now, when there is an unease in anything that you do, and I said the literary is obviously surrounded and obviously obviously centered on this unease. So what happens is that once you get that unease to come into your thinking or come into your uh, understanding, then there is a serious challenge that you start to feel about your individuality. Now, this is, uh, I'm getting into a little complicated area, so I, I will go slow on this. How do you lose your individuality if there is an unease? Uh, uh, look at this, look at this understanding that, that I'm trying to build on with uh, a French thinker, and his name is uh, Gilbert Simonton. Very briefly about him. Simonton, um, uh, uh, somebody who had a very shaping influence on Deleuze, Simonton is actually someone who starts to talk about this idea of the individuality and individuation and how we start to create the spirituality. Spirituality, I think. You know, the spirituality has nothing to do with the religion. What he tells you is that the individuality is the probably the least powerful of your existence. What is very important and what probably should consider, should be considered as building up the aesthetic imaginary or as I say, the literary should be individuation. Individuation is probably something that starts to create the power in the way you start to understand things. And um, how is that possible? Just hold on. I will just read out from Simon then a little and, and, and explain to you what he's, he's trying to do for you here. Um, uh, 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 for instance, if Aristotle, uh, say, uh, uh, looking, is looking at, say, Brown's in his book, The Metaphysics, or uh, uh, Descartes is looking at um, the concept of the wax, and uh, Simon then is looking at the idea of clay. And not only clay, but he's also looking at this idea of brick making. How do you make bricks? So this whole idea of this brick making is something that talks both about geometry and the ungeometricization. You figure something out, commensurability. You unmake that. That is incommensurability. Incommensurability is not disconnected from some. Incommensurability is the unmaking process that goes on. The unmaking process is probably the most important because that is the source and that is where the function of creativity lies. So see how he writes, uh, Simon, then how, how he brings about this particular idea of the uh, 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 individuation. Now, um, what he's trying to do here is with the individuation is that he is trying to produce a kind of a traversing a traversing of the domains of say the physics the biology the psychic uh, the social and when you are that's the reason why i said that class lectures for me would all the time be moving out of the the, the real conventional terrain on the or the narrative of, of of how you explain things and i'm actually not in any way explaining the literature to you here i'm just trying to produce a sort of a, a lot of vapor and uh, I would say there is a, a lot of density around this concept of the literary so that you can come up with your 
incommensurabilities with this concept of the literary with more questions. Uh, this is the individuation where, uh, let me put it very simple for you. There are three states now. Let us look at it this way. There are three states of understanding. One, I call it the pre-individuality. The second is the individuality. And the third is individuation. Now, when I say pre-individuality, it's almost, it, it, it's something that's very Deleuzean, very Deleuze doesn't really think that identity begins at a point because he's talking about singularities all the time. And any, anywhere and, and any kind of subjectivity, any kind of individuality will actually begin at a point that has already begun. So it is not that I begin here and I end here. It's not that my, my identity is A and it reaches up to B. No, it is something in between all the time. There is always, it, if it begins at a point, it would always mean that something already has begun. Something already was there before you thought you have actually started or have begun. So there is all the time that's pre-individuality that pushes you. So any kind of a concept, which is why I'm connecting you uh, all the time to various research scholars here, various scholar people, scholarly people who have actually uh, are attending this this this, this lectures. Uh, for you, the only thing that I want to tell you that how you can connect with this ideas that I'm. I'm trying to unfurl, or in a way, I'm trying to unwind. Uh, any kind of a concept, any kind of a cultural concept, um, for instance, in, 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 even if you're talking about Anthropocene, um, uh, look at how Anthropocene is, is something that you, Bedford with Cruz, and, and when that, uh, the, the, the Nobel laureate stood up and said, whoa, we are not going to hear any Holocene or any kind of concept, let's call it Anthropocene, and the whole world raised a flag and said, now we have a term here called Anthropocene, and everyone starts to write a paper or a book or holding seminars uh, almost with uh, serious phoneticism. Uh, I, I think this, 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 there was nothing that's Anthropocene that is always already there. I mean, it's like if that term was not there, the Anthropocene, when I, when it, before Crutzen comes in, this Anthropocene was very much there all the time because. Uh, the all kinds of things that happen in, in the pre baconian and the post baconian way, the Anthropocene was already something that was building up. It's only that when it started to uh, start pinching the, the, the human skin, that we started to start to think about Anthropocene as a discourse and start to think how we can build our relationship with nature. It was very much there. Even if you go back to the romantics, I mean, if, you, if, you, if you're reading the romantics concepts of nature, there is Anthropocene very much involved. So, you know, this pre-individuality of a concept of the Anthropocene that you're talking about very much existed before you come to this concept of Anthropocene now that you are talking about, which actually means that the word Anthropocene was not there before Anthropocene, but Anthropocene as a literary, Anthropocene as a structureless structure, Anthropocene as a momentum, Anthropocene as a connective potential conceptual entity was very much there. That cannot be denied. That was always there, and that actually contributed to what we have today. So interesting, uh, uh, what we can really say this is that the literary then is simply not about the individuality. Literary is also about the pre-individuality, something that you are not aware, something that you are not affected by, but whose reach and process uh, really, in a way, gets into your uh, uh, understanding of the concept which you say as the individuality, say the Anthropocene for that matter, or for instance, one that we are talking about now. But what is this individuation? Uh, when one talks about this individuality, um, are we really in the, in, in the, are we really held up with Anthropocene or now uh, we start to talk about the good Anthropocene, the bad Anthropocene, we talk about the post Anthropocene, we, we, we start to talk about no Anthropocene. I mean, there is absolutely no Anthropocene. Uh, people, there are some disbelievers. I mean, there are people who don't believe that there is Anthropocene there. And you know, uh, uh, this, these kind of things would actually come in after this Anthropocene as a kind of an individuality, as a kind of an individuality even happens. This is the individuation. Individuation is where the suddenly an identity, a concept, it starts to have its own flux. It starts to have its own laminarity. It starts to have its own ways of loosening up the edges. It starts to have its own boxes created, which you never thought were there within. So, you know, this kind of 
this kind of unfolding disclosure uh, you can say the 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 whole of disclosive thinking I mean with this undertone of Heidegger I mean this disclosive thinking that you see is very much there within a particular identity or concept or a paradigm this is the individuation and 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 uh, it is very important for us to understand that any kind of a concept any kind of an idea that you are talking about will have its own migrancy to it and what is that migrancy the migrancy was there before the concept was so it's a kind of a pre-conceptual pre-identity migrancy because that's the way the whole migrant formations the migrant transformations the the, the migrant flux and the migrant thesis were formed and then once you have that concept with you once you have that idea with you the migrancy continues and this is the not the processuality of thinking you would call it the post processuality of understanding and this is the post processuality which starts to create its own forms of expression it starts to create its own forms of manifestation and this is the individuation and this is what gabel sandon would call the transduction and this transduction is something that creates this kind of spirituality of thinking the spirituality of understanding so what he does here is that he breaks down he breaks down the division between commensurate and incommensurate that is exactly my my thesis um, uh, uh, as i get into uh, writing on the world literature where this is also some sort of finishing a book now and this is where i just want to introduce the whole idea about how this whole idea of commens incommensurability starts to build the world literature and very interestingly if you go back to goethe uh, or, 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 or if you really go to the post garter period where they are talking about this world literature as a network, as connecting, as trying to reach out to things, almost uh, uh, a kind of a kind of a, a throwback on uh, uh, the actor network theory. I mean, that's that's the way if you are looking at this connector that Goethe is talking about, I think it's a failure. That is where, that is how exactly not world literature should work because uh, the whole the whole difficulty about the whole difficulty about the literary of world literature is that it has completely misread the local. There, there, there is a way of understanding how this local works. And once you start to frame about this idea about decoloniality and try to bring the local and the global into a kind of an oppositional matrices, I think the project for me fails because. Um, uh, there has to be a way of reading the literary in what you call a world literature category, which I uh, personally don't believe in. It's where this whole idea of the literary, it is seriously something that talks about this incommensurability of understanding. You have an unease about certain things. You are, you are having a kind of a dystopic contentment about reading literature. Let us put it this way. There is a kind of a dystopic dystopic contentment about reading. I mean, dystopia should really be disappoint, but I'm not saying that. Dystopic, dystopic contentment about reading something, and that is exactly where the entropic energy of the system lies. That is where the system starts to break down. That is where you start to see that the system really invites its own destruction. This is um, something that um, very easily you can associate with Nietzsche or you, 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 you can obviously uh, understand, put it down to um, the various, the, the French continental part I mean, after the 1920s to the 1950s, which starts talking about this breaking down. But for me, this is one part of the literary, the individuation that Gilman and Simon Gilman is talking about. Now, Gilbert Simon um Individuation leads me to two kinds of ideas, which are obviously something that I want to share with you, my own ideas about uh, how one looks at the literary. Is the literary for you concrete or is the literary for you liquid? Now, this is a part that um, I, I would like to talk to you about because um, whenever we are talking about the literary, we are talking about an equilibrium. And uh, uh, what is this equilibrium? This equilibrium can be of various types. One equilibrium can be the stable equilibrium that is all of us want to be in. For instance, this understanding of the local 
as I said, the local and the global. So you say, oh, I'm going to globalize or I'm going to globalize or you say globalization and literature. For me, that's a very, very stable equilibrium. That, that, that is something that you can rest in without the unease. Then comes the question of the disequilibrium. I mean, Bartolomfi would, would, be, would be talking about this disequilibrium and disequilibrium in a sense that you break the equilibrium, you try to disrupt the structure, you try to determine a kind of a disturbance in the way you start to think about a certain things. I agree with that. That is also a way of looking at the literary. I agree with that. That's, that's also a different way of understanding things. So where you say that I don't believe this, I do believe this, and almost like this, this, this not, uh, I do not, the, the bottle by phenomenon starts to come in and then you start to produce a sort of disequilibrium in anything that you see. So um, the, the disequilibria uh, can be one of the ways of looking at a certain concept that you don't agree with or you have different, uh, 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 I would say, counter or in a way counter circulation that you want to bring into an understanding. And the third part that interests me the most, and uh, this is where I, I, I really pitch my tense in, and that's where you call it the meta equilibrium. Now, this meta stable equilibrium is a very interesting phenomenon. Let me tell you this before I start to talk about what I mean by concrete and liquid text. Um, I would just halt a little because it's not a talk, it's a classroom lecture. I mean, am I being comprehensible? Are you people, uh, since I've been talking for almost an hour now, are you being able to get the points that I'm trying to make? I would be happy if there are some few responses popping up on my screen so that. It really inspires me to go ahead, Father. Um, this is um, uh, this is one. Uh, thank you, thank you for that. I mean, I, I'm just trying to trying to figure out whether you people are actually getting my ideas or thoughts. Actually, this is important for me to know because there are such a complicated ideas that are uh, that have been put across. So it's always nice to really get some um, feedback. So coming to this idea of um, metastable equilibrium, um, this is the most interesting part about it. And uh, let me explain this to you. Uh, you know, what happens in a metastable equilibrium is that uh, everything seems to be in equilibrium. Please note the word I'm using. It is equilibrium, it is disequilibrium, but um, if it is, if it is, it seems to be in equilibrium, then the problem arises. Because if you say it seems to be in equilibrium, then you know there must be some concealed factor, some kind of an actant that hides within, which might disrupt what you see as the reality of the equilibrium. So, you know, what happens is that in a metastable equilibrium, Anything can change with the slightest change of a factor within that particular formation. Uh, for instance, uh, if one formation needs to change, then there has to be some radical change, some groundbreaking change, some strong change, some feeble change, uh, 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 maybe some minor change, maybe some major change, so that the whole structure or the condition changes, whether it's a thought, whether you're understanding, whether it's kind of a cultural reality, whatever. Um, but when it comes to the idea of the metastable equilibrium, you know, as I said, slightest of change, the most feeble, the most feeble change uh, that you get to see can really change the flow, the structure, the state of things for you. So it is not what you get to see that there is this is a stable equilibrium or this is an unstable equilibrium. When you say metastable equilibrium, it seems that everything is okay. Everything's all right. But uh, something can really go off right, something will really go off axis if there is the slightest, feeblest of change that happens. This is where the real, the, the real idea of the literary lies. And this is the interesting part about transduction because any kind of transductive understanding of things would actually mean that rest assured, you do have a center, you do have an essence. Um, this way, I'm actually not going into deconstruction at all because I think uh, Derrida uh, uh, has been very misunderstood over the years. 
um, he never said, he never said that there is no essence or there is no center. There is that center, there is that essence, but the point of the matter is that somewhere these are vulnerable. Now, can I call it, can I call it that uh, when we are thinking, we are not talking about no center, decenter, recenter, uh, a disrupted center, uh, unhinged center. Can I call it the fragile center? I mean, I um, uh, can I call this to be a sort of uh, a very fragile center, a vulnerable center? Because you know, this word vulnerable, it comes from the word vulnus, which actually means wound. That is when you hurt someone. So if that wound remains in you, that wound can erupt or manifest in different forms later. Sometimes you can hide your wound, but maybe the, the curative period that it takes might vary. Something might manifest out of it which you are not sure about. So maybe that vulnerable center is very much there in metastable equilibrium. So this is where the understanding of the literary becomes important where another category that i'm bringing into the literary after i said opposite and opposition and then i said the, the idea of individuation and um and also the question about uh the the, the idea of this metastable equilibrium and now i say the vulnerable center that literary any idea of the literary will have but this brings me to something that i would like to theorize here for you all is this idea of the concrete and the liquid. Um, you know, there has been, um, there has been this, this, this idea of the concrete and the liquid when, uh, when, I, when I start to speak to you about it. Um, Phil Hegel and Marx, they really talk a lot about the, the fluid and the molten state and the solid a lot in their writings. And that is not the point here. That is something that uh, we can take up later. But what I'm interested in is to see that can there be two kinds of uh, uh, concept about a concrete literary, uh, liquid literary, and there is a concept that I introduced. It's 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 a term that you can use together. It's called liquid concrete. I, I, I'm not I'm not saying separately. I'm not saying liquid concrete. I'm saying liquid concrete, almost like Karen Barrett talking about the space time matrix. It's 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 a word that comes together. Uh, seriously denounced by the, by the dictionary, but uh, something that can, of course, form part of your vocabulary. So when uh, Barrett talks about the space-time matrix, then it's, it's a way of multitudinous, simultaneous, at the same time, a kind of, um, a, a, kind of a, way, a kind of a way of seeing how everything really falls in place at the same time, where there is very difficulty, there is a lot of difficulty actually to separate between the space, the matter, and the time. So it's the space-time mattering. That's the way it comes in. So mattering is all about how you collapse space and time. So um, it is almost in that uh, uh, sort of a fashion. I I would like to say that there is not concrete or the or, 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 or the liquid, but I would say it's liquid concrete. Now, when you say liquid concrete as a kind of a concept, then what kind of liquid concrete are you talking about? What kind of a concept is that? Let me explain this to you. Um, a little and see whether I can really make some sense here. Um, Simonton is actually uh, uh, talking about uh, this idea of the coming together. And when he talks about coming together, he is generally talking about elagomatism. I mean, it's elagomatic. Elagomatism is, is, is a way of how you try to bring things together, like um, um, if you go back to to understand this word alagma, then uh, obviously it means thing taken in exchange, and then it stems from the word alasite, which means actually to exchange and barter, and the word alos actually means another. So when you talk about alagmatism, then it is it is it is the first thing that you take is things taken in exchange. That's the first one. And then, of course, it comes to at a kind of you're exchanging barter. That's what you're doing. And at the same time, there is the idea of the another. All three coming together in this idea of the allagmatism. And this allagmatism is about uh, very much a part about 
a dynamicism, or you can call it a kind of a metamorphosis. You can call it um, always a provocative energy for apparent or, or sustained disruption. But remember, something that I clearly believe that it is also a principled understanding of structuralism. Remember that um, whenever you whenever you talk about stable, unstable, metastable equilibrium, it's all about structure. There is no way that uh, uh, I mean, off late, my position is very clear and sharp. But I do not see anything in this world, any kind of an idea existing without a structure. Even if um, my recent work that I'm doing on random, and especially on art. Um, I'm still seeing that the whole idea that even if a random is there, it's a very rational random. Even if there is a chance, there is a very reasonable chance. So you know, you cannot you cannot you cannot deny structure to really think about something. It's a very difficult thing to do. Uh, although it's a very lucrative and at the same time a very tempting thought to believe in. I'm telling you that you just about feel that well, something doesn't have a structure, so you're very tempted by that idea. But the underlying thing is that everything would have a principled understanding of structuralism. So allegmatism would have that with uh, very much in it. But the difference that I uh, am trying to talk to you about is that when it comes to when it comes to Simonton, then Simonton is talking about uh, the idea of field. I mean, the field. Well, it could be a magnetic field, it could be a cultural field, it could be a political field. But he's talking about field. And in that field, he's uh, actually appropriating the properties of the magnetic field, where there are three magnets in the three corners of the room. There are three magnets in the three corners of the room, and they are all introduced with a non-magnetic piece of iron. So uh, I repeat this for you. There is a magnetic field where there are three magnets in three corners of the room, and this is introduced with a non-magnetic piece of iron. Now, what happens here is that this changes the field of interaction where the structure of the magnetic field changes. Uh, this, this produces the difference in structure of the magnetic field. And what the difference does it make? The difference is that the fourth element, that is when I was talking about this non-magnetic piece of iron, that also gets magnetized. Now, something that I was not, I become. Uh, something that you did not consider as the literary becomes the literary. Something that you did not consider the local becomes the local. Something that you always felt is outside the purview of the global becomes the global. So, you know, this is the way of how you magnetize, magnetize the unmagnetic element in your understanding. And this is the transduction force, or you can call it the transductive force that you bring into your understanding of thinking. And importantly enough, this is the exchange. How uh, three magnets and there is one uh, that is on non-magnetic iron piece. Now what happens here? There is an exchange between the three. There is an exchange that goes on. And what kind of exchange? First is that you say exchange, the crossover, and then you drop the X. So it becomes change. So what happens? The non-magnetic is magnetized. So in the exchange, there is the change. So, you know, it is almost like, as I, as, as I have told you, that in the synchronicity, there is the asynchronicity. In the causality, there is the equality. There in the local is the global. The global has the local. You just cannot in any way distinguish and produce an opposite paradigms to understand the problem. So the whole question of this exchange comes in. And what happens to this transductive interiority? Let me let me let me use this. I, I'm avoiding avoiding technical words as much as I can because that's not a, not, that is not really the purpose of these uh, uh, this lectures. Uh, even if you're using this term transductive interiority, then what is this transductive interiority doing? It is producing what you can technically call ontogenesis. Now, ontogenesis is both about the migrancy from one point to another, then also the same time that you are talking about the, the, the idea of the exchanging, then you talk about change, 
And then you talk about coming together, coming together, and coming together at the same time. This is the this is where your understanding has to has to work on. Coming together, A coming to B, B coming to A, but at the same time coming together as an event. And uh, 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 later, of course, we might we might talk a little more about value and uh, uh, there's those ideas about this uh, the multiplicities that he talks about that exist within an event. But that's when the occasion arises. That's many things will come into the lectures in the forthcoming weeks. So this is this is what I I call the idea of understanding something within an allegmatic concept. Now, in allegmatic concept, you cannot differentiate between the concrete and the liquid. This is the, this is the idea with which probably I, I, I will end, uh, because one and a half hour is good enough. So it is, it is this idea of the allegmatism where you start to differentiate between the concrete and the liquid. I do not say concrete and the liquid anymore. I say liquid concrete. And when I say liquid concrete, uh, it is about this brick making, the, the, the molding and the packing of the clay into the mold. That is a very interesting understanding of Sanderton. I read from that so that I can, I, I can have a better understanding of what you people are trying to get at. What I read out of this is that um, there is a process of becoming in which a potential in the system made up a mold hand clay is actualized according to the positivity of taking form to which none of the components is privileged as determining. Any of the component that starts to produce the clay, it starts to produce the form, um, that is not considered as a determining. Like if it has to be ABC, then A and B and C, they are not considered as determining factors. It's only when they are coming together, it's when they are allegmatically combined, it is then that they are considered to be contributing to the A and C. Now, this is where the individuality is dropped and individuation comes up into the open. Also, you might put it this way, that this technical operation depends on learned brick-making skills on knowledge of the right kind of clay and how it is made ready. The efficient type of mold to use and the energy required in the form of an amount of work. It is because of all these elements that are conjoined in a relation of reciprocal becoming or actualization. This is the reciprocal becoming or actualization, which actually doesn't mean that A reciprocates B exactly like the way B reciprocates A. There is a serious amount of disequilibrium between these two components all the time. So this is where the mold, hand and clay, they come together in a constitutive action, in a constitutive relation. But this relation does not stay as a relation. This stays technically, technically, you may call this as relationality. The relationality is something that becomes extremely important when I'm using this term liquid concrete. Now, what does that do then? Your cultural thinking, your political thinking, your epistemological thinking, whatever thinking that you try to do across disciplines, whether you're thinking about borders, whether you're thinking about partition, whether, you, whether you're thinking about any kind of a cultural category, whether you're thinking about nature, all these would require this idea of the liquid concrete that I, I, I'm trying to establish here. So in, the, in this, in this uh, uh, liquid concrete state, what one does is that it is, does not necessarily mean that it is a more than individual phenomenon. Like for instance, um, if I say A plus B plus C producing ABC, that looks very decent, that looks very fair. But uh, would that mean that this ABC, if A is not a determining factor in ABC, rather A being with B and B with C and C with B and B with A and ABC together and ABC coming together as not ABC but CBA, that's the kind of a mesh, that's the kind of a flux, that's the kind of a metastability that I'm talking about. That would create the ABC. Then the interesting part is that when you look at the word, sorry, 
this, this literary, the literary has a sort of a extremely complicated imaginary to it. And this imaginary, uh, before, before I, I, I finish this, this imaginary would have one little aspect to this. And this is the final point. Uh, we will carry on this in the next class. The, the point about it is that we are very interested in the membrane. Now, what is a membrane? That's, uh, that's also something that uh, I have discussed and I have theorized as well. One is that if you are talking about the way I did, A plus B plus C, C plus B plus A, A, B plus C, or B, C plus A. So there are so many different structures, as I said, that any kind of the literary will have different kind of structures formed into it, enfolded into it. So if it is such a kind of a dynamic, restless entanglement that you're talking about, then the interesting part is that you start to ask me the question about, am I losing the center? Is it that you spoke about a vulnerable center? You spoke about a fragile center? Or is that we are losing it almost all the time? So where is the center? This is where the idea of the membrane comes in. Because you know, every kind of thinking that you do needs to have a form. I mean, even if you're thinking nonsensically, nonsense is a form. And when you are thinking nonsensically about something, then that nonsensicality of production also needs a kind of sensibility of form structures because you cannot produce nonsensibility or nonsensibility in a sense of uh, nonsense without actually putting up a logic of sense in your understanding of things. So interestingly then, you need to produce this idea of the membrane. What does a membrane do? The membrane has this ability of differentiating thoughts. It does differentiate thoughts because membrane actually becomes a way of separating A and B. But when it separates A and B, it performs three functions. First function is that it separates A from B or B from A. So it doesn't encourage any kind of a free flow of A and B. So if it doesn't encourage free flow, it actually means that A's identity and B's identity are maintained. There is a way of attesting, attesting if you think about the membrane, there is a way of attesting the identity of A as against B or B against A. That's one. The second thing that a membrane does is that the membrane starts to regulate the flow of the transfusion between A and B. The membrane decides how much of A that is on the other side can reach B or how much of B can really enjoy the absorption of the A. So the membrane actually becomes this kind of a deciding, a determinant factor in a way it starts to discuss about the flux and the flow. That's the, another part of how you start to talk about the membrane. And the third part is that the membrane also wants to separate A and the B, but at times, the membranic structure fails and there are certain par collations that go from A to B and B to A. Please note what I'm saying. There are three stages that I've, I'm theorizing for you. First is that the membrane that differentiates and there is a kind of a segregation and succession of A and B. The second part is that the membrane becomes a deciding determinant factor, the decider that decides that A and B how much of A would get into B and how much of B can A enjoy cohabiting with. So this is the second part of it. And the third part that I'm talking about is when the membrane by itself becomes a failure. When the membrane realizes that there is, it's, 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 it's a victim of its own vulnerability. When there are certain things that percolate from A to B and B to A, producing, uh, well, well, you can call it the Derridean contamination if you really want to. So this is where the membrane comes in. So the membrane, in a way, refuses to become a certain clear, structured understanding. Membranic thinking, this is what I call it, membranic thinking actually becomes a way of seeing how this literary now becomes a way of understanding, not, not, not simply about serious identity differences, not also the identity in process, but at the same time, losing control over the formations of the identity. So what happens here in membranic thinking, if you connect that with the literary, is that there are certain thoughts that you can structure. There are certain thoughts that you can structure and differentiate with others. 
And there are certain thoughts that you structure. And then you realize that the very structuration is itself its own vulnerability. It's itself its own weakness. It's itself its own disintegration. So when such a thing happens, then anything that you see around has a kind of structure, structurality, and structuration to it. All three coming together to produce what you actually call the literary. So if you say that um, uh, that this, this idea about that uh, how how this literary can be formed say whether it's secular whether it's religion whether it's nature whether it's anthropocene whether you whether you talk about this idea of transnationality all these are literary for me and this literary can really be understood through these particular concepts that i just mentioned now although there are a lot many coming up in my next class sessions with you but um, I would like to end here uh, by saying that um, um, this liquid concrete that I spoke about here is just not a category. This liquid concrete is both about being solid, being liquid, being not solid, being not liquid, being somewhere in between, all three things coming together. And anything that you consider as liquid concrete will have this membranic thinking to it. Anything that uh, you call it the literary, whether it's the secularism or the secular nature, uh, uh, violence, or migrancy, or hybridity, or fundamentalism, whatever way you look at the literary, the membranic thinking is something that starts to actually create your clarity at the same time, your status, and at the same time, your voice of understanding. I leave you people here um, with this uh, this much today. It was one and a half hour is pretty enough, but I will be happy, very happy to take questions here if you if you do have any. Um, just uh, just give me uh, just a second so that I can just connect this with my computer. My computer is running out of battery. I'll I'll, I'll be just taking your question. Just hold on. Yes, I'm back, so you can, uh, you can ask me questions now. Surely, questions you have. Yeah. Uh, there, were a lot of, there are some questions that popped up, uh, but I'm sorry, I was talking, so I missed out on them. Um, can you repeat those questions? I'll be happy if you, if you switch on your microphone and ask me as well. There is no problem there. Uh, good evening, uh, Professor Bhush. I'm Anuradha here. Yeah, Anuradha, yes. Uh, so I was, uh, I had already written down the question, but then uh, since you happened to miss it, I would just like to ask, uh, I'm very intrigued, uh, you know, with this concept of uh, this liquid concrete and yeah. uh, this coming together, as you say. Uh, could you just uh, explain or just, you know, uh, uh, tell me how it is uh, different from or similar to Coleridge's idea of uh, the literary imagination being as in plastic? Oh, yeah. Um, look, uh, the point uh, is that there, there is a distinction because um, when, when, when this particular word is used like as in plastic, then it does have a kind of uh, genealogy because this word as in plasticism has a kind of a tradition in, in, in German aesthetics before Coleridge starts to appropriate that. Mm -hmm. So what he actually does there is that he is talking about the plasticization, the plasticization in the sense that 
uh, uh, this would actually require a little bit of uh, discussion here. The thing is that, you know, this word plastic, um, it, 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 it comes from the Greek word plastikos. And plastikos is all about molding, how you start to mold a certain things, how you try to sculpt a certain things. But interestingly, if one looks into the, the tradition of uh, the, the idea of plastic, and plastic has a very different progression over the, over the years in terms of its uh, in terms of its conceptual and theoretical growth. The first is that when it comes to plastic as a molding, that was the first part of its growth. Then the second part of its growth is primarily with uh, uh, go and plastic as sculpting. So, you know, it is uh, less of molding than less of it's about sculpting. If plastic is most about malleability, like the way the Greeks would look at it, that is when you're looking at the liquefaction of certain things, moving one, moving into the other, if that is what is, that is what is the pre-garden way of understanding plastic, post-garden, post-garden understanding of plastic is sculpting, where the whole agency changes, the agency of understanding certain things changes. And when one actually does the sculpting, then the idea of agentializing a certain product or a certain production, that particular thing changes. Something that um, very interestingly, uh, Hegel um, uh, moves away from this understanding of the plastic of Goethe and something that Catherine Malabo picked up later to talk about forming you know first when you talk about plastic that's the this the, 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 that's about the malleability then the second stage of understanding is about sculpting and the third part about is the forming they don't say formed they say forming so in case of Coleridge it is about sculpting certain things in a case of SM plasticization of certain things. And this has a very, very, very strong, formidable and well-invested uh, 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 history of ideas coming from the German aesthetics, it's primarily aesthetics being spoken about a kind of a structuration, a kind of structural way of looking at certain things. So Coleridge's SM plastic will not have this liquid concrete element to that. Coleridge's understanding would, would be something where you are trying to transform certain things in a kind of and a kind of a productive kinetic way of producing from one stage to another. So this is something that um, uh, Coleridge would actually do uh, when, he, when he's talking about his plasticism. But you know what Coleridge's idea will not be able to clarify is the question about the exchange that I spoke about, the question of the allegmatism that I spoke about as a kind of a combination of the pre-individual, the individual and the individuation. So Coleridge's idea would primarily be about how one sculpts out a product one, product two, three, four, five into a product six. But the formation is where the difference lies. The, the formation is about a different lies. When I say this, I mean that Coleridge would be a way of producing or rather the productionist metaphysics of Coleridge would be about creating a structure out of different structures that come into play. And the liquid concrete concept that I'm talking about is where there is always the vulnerability of something happening there any time and uh, something that Coleridge will not connect with the metastable equilibrium at all. For Coleridge, it would primarily be the transformative aspect of looking at SM plasticism. For me, it is more about the allegmatism of looking at plastic. So that's the difference basically that exists. Yes, yes, I, I understand. Thank you so much, uh, Professor. Hello, Ron Yes, yes. Oh, we have some questions here and on yeah. YouTube as well. Yeah. Now, uh, I think I can ask the questions on their behalf. Yeah, sure. Yeah. And Ognibo Maiti has asked a very long and lengthy question. Mm -hmm. I request Ognibo to ask your question. On yes. Your yeah, that is better. It's to keep it short. Yeah. Of two yeah. paragraphs. Oh. Ognibo, just unmute your microphone and ask the question. Ognibo, are you there? Ognibo. 
Okay. We can go to the next question. Hello. Yeah. I think I should ask Shubhayu Bhattacharya's question. Yeah. The idea of the three, three stages is also somewhat indicative of a tussle, opposition between humanism and post humanism, in the sense that while the detonation of the rounded off ages will require cognition of the entropic X, it might also require certain conditions within bracket on which human agency is dependent for such a cognition. Um, um, well, I think um, um, the Shubhai's question, uh, well, Shubhayu, I mean, try to try to try to uh, rephrase your question because i get you i get what exactly what you're trying to say but try to rephrase the question so that uh people here on the portal can also understand what you are aiming at shiba you can ask the question yes that is better because i know what you're what you're trying to say but rephrase the question so that people can understand and i can respond and there can be an engagement yes yeah 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 uh, yes sir mm -hmm. uh, actually i was uh there are basically, I mean, for the shortage of space, I was not able to convey yeah, actually yeah. two things that are uh, relevant to this discussion. Mm -hmm. One is the question of the three stages that you proposed uh, related to pre-individuality, individuality, and then individuation. Yeah. Uh, this got me thinking about the question of, not really the question, it is like the confounding of the opposition between agency and non-agency. Mm -hmm. Because... Uh, to be able to figure out the X, and I use the word X because we do not really know what might cause a certain system to give off or give way to something else. Uh, when we want to figure out the X, are we not also uh, maybe overlooking the question of agency in the sense some will, because of certain conditions, be that, be that social or historical or cultural or linguistic as it may, may not be able to figure you know might not be able to figure out that particular x or many such x's which in turn is required for the edges to be you know dismantled or the rounding off to yeah, be squared yeah. so okay to speak. Uh, yeah i get you i get you what you're trying to say i get you but the the, the answer to this is would be would be would be very straight and clear uh when you're talking about agency then the whole idea of the neo-materialist turn in thinking, uh, if one looks at the neo-materialist turn in thinking, then you would see that this idea of agency doesn't necessarily have to be anthropogenic anymore. Because if, um, if plants can think, then the interesting part is that I don't decide whether a plant thinks or not. I mean, the plant can plant things because the plant thinks. And so long, what we have been doing is that we, as the the the, the anthropogenic, anthropogenic self-regarding, uh, uh, the hegemonizer deciding what the non-human really does, that particular thing really ends. Because when one gets into this state of individuation, as I pointed out, the agencies agencies multiply. The agencies become more. It becomes a splatter to 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 put a technical term. It becomes a splatter, and at the same time, this agency also gets connected to different kinds of non-anthropogenic agencies that we are talking about. Culture is not something that we build. We, in the sense of the the, the anthropos, culture is not in the sense in which we build it. Culture also comes out of the non-anthropos direction or an non-anthropos potencies that surround us. So interestingly, um, the, the, the area that, um, the, that you are hinting at is that even if we talk about this word post and the kind of post that, uh, that exists, whatever we are talking about, this post will have a certain kind of difficulty, a certain kind of a uh, certain kind of, um, you could say, the antinomies that would come where um, agencies related to the anthropos and agencies related to the non-anthropos will come together and will produce what you consider as the cultural or the political or the social understanding related to the individuation. So I think the neo-materialist dimension would be important here. 
and uh, also studies that look into the the post anthropogenic ways of looking at things i think this would be uh, clearly that what i was trying to get at so uh, making something is not just anthropically centered making something also has its non anthropos dimension but they are not in opposition to each other don't think that these people these two paradigms are in opposition there is a kind of there is a kind of a i would say a restive trans dialectic if you if you want to use the Christian term it's a kind of a trans dialectic that builds between these two different agencies yes yeah. okay thank you sir yeah so ronil the next question is from devagrato odhikari uh -huh. uh, yes this question is can we identify the term meta stable equilibrium with fluctuating certainty or undulating certainty also uh -huh. yeah, can yes. some, yeah. mm. this next part this next part of the question can the term incommensurability be related with the dialectic relation of one material object with another uh, yeah i mean the that's a that's a different way of expressing it i mean if you say uh, the the question of certainty is unstable certainty is it, that's the term you use right unstable certainty that's what the term you are using and 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 uh, metastable equilibrium with fluctuating certainty or undulating yes, fluctuating yeah 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 fluctuating certainty i mean uh, that's a that's a good term to use here but i think um uh there, there, there is so much to say here i, I would say that this word fluctuation um this is a very important term here because fluctuation would just not be a uh, blipping in and out or that kind of moving in and moving out syndrome fluctuation is something that is so much an ontological reality of our existence so much an ontological uh, aspect of our understanding of any kind of thing any kind of agencies that we talk about so um and also the very idea of certainty i mean um, i would i i would probably need another uh, while of a breath of a time to talk about certainty because certainty is a philosophical discourse and uh, this 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 idea of the certainty uncertainty and relativism they come together within a very strong philosophical discourse springing from the post enlightenment so um your term is interesting i i i love this term which you said the fluctuating certainty um but uh, remember something that uh, this fluctuating certainty should not be considered as a kind of a monolith it should not be considered as a kind of a structured conceptual entity uh, this is this is just a way of looking at reality this is just a way of looking at the ways of thinking that we are surrounded by because um, fluctuating certainty um, in this very interesting oxymoronic uh, potency that it develops i think again it comes back to this idea about this membranic thinking if you connect this with the membranic thinking you would see that how exactly these two areas about fluctuation and certainty needs to have a kind of a membranic thinking in between so that you make better sense of that idea yes thank you thank you now the next question is from jyotishmita sarkar she yes. is from what i understand so far ontogenesis from what i understand so far ontogenesis is a concept which reminds me of ofeban to what degree can they be used interchangeably um can you can you just type out this question i couldn't hear you clearly uh, is is jyotishmita can you type this question out i just want to have a look I read, 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 read again yeah yeah please do i didn't get it from what i understand so far ontogenesis is a concept which reminds me of ofeban to what degree can they be used interchangeably okay um if you're talking about ofeban um uh, uh, then obviously yes i mean to an extent you can but i think uh, this 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 ofeban if you are if i'm getting the pronunciation right for you are you referring to hegel jyotishmita yes jyotishmita are you referring to ofibung as the yes sir yes sir the hegelian term? yes yes yes, yes. Yeah. so 
Yeah, that, that's what I'm interested in. So Offerbung is that sublation that you're talking about. Yes, um, um, I don't think these two things would really come together. And there is not much of a purchase that probably one can draw bringing these two concepts together. Because I think uh, if you are talking about the, the Hegelian aspect of it, I think Hegel doesn't talk about ontogenesis here. I think ontogenesis would probably be uh, more, more, more attuned to or approximate probably in the, in the third wave science cybernetic theory. And uh, in these, this cyberneticism or the third wave cybernetic theory would more come more closely to uh, ontogenesis like the, the Catherine Halesian way of looking at network. But um, the Offerbund that of Hegel is more is, is more related to the supersession of consciousness. It's more related to the very idea of the supersession that Hegel talks about. And the supersession is uh, something that I do not see uh, very much close to the idea of ontogenesis here. Yeah. Okay, so thank you, sir. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, Ranilda, can we take more questions? We have a list of questions. Okay. I mean, I just went to, Okay, fine. No problem. Okay. So we can we can take questions till nine. That's okay. 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 So we have time. So the next question is from Nobonita Roy. She's asking. Sir, in the moment of pre-individuality, could we say the phenomenon is absent, but its materiality, structurality, already always exists or existed? Could we then think of the concept of pre-individuality as something that refutes Cartesian subject, that I exist before I am thought of in an I can, of, uh, uh, can, you, can you repeat this question again because it's a long one. I, I uh, can you repeat it again? Yeah. Uh, in the moment of pre-individuality, could we say the phenomenon is absent, but its materiality, structurality, already always exists or existed? This is hmm. the first. That's question. true. That's true because. Um, uh, the the phenomenon did not the, the the phenomenon was very much there. I mean, whether you call it uh, the the pre phenomenon of understanding phenomenon in the present, that is that is that is where the the the, the basic crux of the understanding comes from. Because um, if if one there you know there is a distinction that one makes about uh, the phenomenology looking into the idea of the phenomenon and how. Uh, the how phenomenon probably would be looked at from a very Kantian standpoint as well. I think the to say phenomenon uh, would would for me if this is this is where you get into the philosophical sharpness of the rigor of the understanding, then I would say you have to specify exactly the what kind of a phenomenon you're talking about and which philosophical tradition you are trying to bring that into. Because if it is that so if it's the phenomenological tradition and you're falling on the the the, the post to Serlian down to Mario Ponti and the rest, then it becomes a different kind of understanding. But if you are going back to the 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 Kantian way of looking at phenomenon, then obviously um, that's a different argument. I um, I would I would seek more clarification for this question because if you're looking at Kant, then the Kant the phenomena is a very different different kind of understanding. But if one gets to this idea of Ponti, then phenomena is a very different kind of understanding. So it's very important for me to know exactly what what kind of tradition are you looking at before we can clarify this answer. Yes. Any um, any other questions, uh, sir? Uh, yes, can I ask please, a question? Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah. So basically, I was um, comparing the idea of transinfusionized thought magma, or the cosmopolitan mix of ideas that that are building. Uh, kind of, I, I was comparing that thought with the uh, with the plurality of onikantovad, or the many sidedness of Jainism. And I was just uh, reading Devi Prasad Chakravarti the other day, the Shadbad uh, in, uh, prediction, and there was this equation of JBS Holden, and uh, when the equation is x to the power two minus three x plus two is equal to zero, then x can be either one or two, 
or if I remember correctly, there are um, uh, there another equation where x to the power three minus x to the power two plus x minus one is equal to zero. Then x can be one or plus minus root minus one, something like that. Mm -hmm. So I was just saying this: all these possibilities in transinfusionized reading of the literary can simultaneously retain the form and the formability of all these kind of local brackets. So I was just making a comment. <laughs> how can uh, compare this with the Sadbad and Anikantavad? Uh, yes, this I understand. I, uh, maybe that from the when I do the next uh, session with you and when I start to talk about the bracket and uh, um, when I start to speak about a little more on mathematics and uh, things will be even even more clear because um, I think uh, there is uh, more to more to our understanding than what we have actually done when we look at how Michel Serre looks at mathematics mm -hmm. and how uh, Michel says looking at the mathematics is a way of looking at the understanding of the epistemological complications and epistemological negotiations that goes around us even 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 if that be a kind of a cultural thinking or even it be post-cultural thinking or political thinking for that matter so the 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 equation that you're talking about is is again coming back to what Shubayu mentioned about the x uh, something that again i will speak about next time when i talk about and talk to you next time when i talk about the x and how x becomes such an important factor for uh, the, the the French Greek philosopher like Cornelius Castoriot is talking about this idea of the X. Um, uh, you know this 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 idea of the transinfusion that you mentioned is 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 very much rooted to the bracket because transinfusion when you write the write the word you, you you never miss the bracket because if you miss the bracket in the word in in if you're missing that. Then you're missing the whole word because that just becomes a word. I think the, that is not so inane, that is not so fair, and that is not so innocent a word, because this this bracket that you put around in changes the way that you start to think. Because you can call it transfusion, you can call it infusion, you can call it trans infusion. So um, there are lots of things that start to get played into or played up. So I my point would be here. Uh, to 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 so if you can wait out a little and see what I actually do with you in the second class, where there is more about this bracketing and mathematics that I will bring in, and obviously, and obviously, something that I'm going to do is about bringing more Hegel into it because um, this this idea of the literary has a lot to do with totality and how this totality is uh, not not something like uh, uh, to use the word that uh, look. Nasi uses about unitotality. It's not about a unitotality, but totality as a kind of a dispersed entity, totality as a kind of a shared entity. So sheer in the sense of uh, not shared, I mean sheared entity. So we will look into this much in, 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 in more intensely when we uh, see each other next time. Yes. Hello, okay. sir. Good evening. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm Ravi. Sure. Yes. Uh, so I have a question. Uh, when you talked about like synchronization, like mm. uh, like even in physics, like everything is synchronizing, like every particle is coming together, like mm. it's a theory in physics. And also you talked about uh, like magnetic, like three magnets if you if you put and all that. Mm. And then uh, when I read like uh, Deleuze and Guattari, uh, so he gave a term called rhizome. Uh, mm. So he talked about like the. Uh, rhizome is a botanical term, you know, where grass, you know, grows yes. randomly. And yes. you also talked about, you know, that uh, uh, there is, there is, everything is in random. There is no uh, such uh, uh, sort of like uh, you talked about. Uh, there is a center, but uh, but you know, uh, Guattari and Deleuze, they said that there is no center. There is no such thing as a center. Uh, they are constantly growing, you know, in term of like postmodernism, like it's thing uh, like deconstructing like when we deconstructing something uh, it's it's like there is no center at all this is what he talked about but so you talked about that there is a center but it's a frizzle center so my question is like uh, what could be that frizzle center uh, that you talked about like how can we you know implement uh, in um, yes i get you i did i i said that this is a position that i have very uh, deeply invested in at this moment yes, sir. and this position is about structure I don't see anything 
I don't see anything that was I mentioned, even if it be sense or nonsense. Whatever you do, there has to be that logic behind it. And there is all the time a structure, which is why when I have uh, taught and written on plasticity, I have always considered that to be a structured plasticity. So I mentioned this part that uh, when I said about center, I said that you talk about disruption of center, you talk about decentering, recentering, or you talk about dislocation. I say it's a called a fragile center. I say it's a vulnerable center, but center nonetheless. Any kind of any kind of a thought, any kind of a concept, any kind of a system that you build, there there would be this fragile center to it. And why say fragile? Because this fragility is a part of the center's regrowth. This fragility is also a part of the center denying its own centrality. This fragility is also a part of the center asking questions about its legitimacy as a center. So, you know, this is the fragility that I've spoken about. And um, Deleuze, uh, when on Gattari, when they speak about rhizomatism, then I think um, uh, they progressed a lot after that. I mean, there is also very important for one to see how Deleuze talks about the capitalism. Because uh, when you talk about, when, when, when Deleuze speaks about capitalism, then his capitalism is a structure that continuously starts to dismantle itself. If you are looking at capitalism as a structure that settles in, sovereignizes itself, and in the end or eventually hegemonizes the other, that's not the kind of capitalism that Deleuze talks about. The capitalism for Deleuze would be where capitalism becomes its own reason, its own cause, for dismantling. So, you know, this rhizome for me is not just about a network that you build exteriorly. There is no exteriority of network that for me rhizome, can, the rhizome in a way sponsors or inspires me to think. Rhizome for me, that's the way I, that's the way I, I tangentially read the rules. Rhizome for me is this transductive interiority, the point that I mentioned. It's a kind of a transductive interiority with which rhizome functions. That is, when you know that you are not connected, you are connected. When you thought that you are connected, you know that the disconnections are there. I mean, when you are aware of disconnections, you know that disconnections actually provide you with the platform or the foundations to get connected. So, you know, this way of not being able to understand uh, 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 over-understand, misunderstand, this continues and which is the reason why this this term that I just came across with using fluctuations of certainty exists. Because certainty, if it becomes understanding, any kind of understanding is a kind of question that you ask yourself because, you know, uh, understanding comes with two things to it. One is your agnosis, that is the ignorance, and another is your wise acreness or your comprehensibility. So what you actually consider as the certainty is your understanding built on the structures or the crutches or the limbs of certainty. This is what you do with knowledge, but every knowledge is very much ontologically or, 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 or should I say every knowledge in a way is centered with a fragile center called agnosis. Agnosis is one of the reasons why you build knowledge. You cannot oppositionalize uh, uh, knowledge with ignorance or agnosis for that matter. So um, one last point here uh, before, before I move to the next question is that if you go back to lead, uh, read uh, Fossier Le Roule, uh, who talks about this non-philosophy, then in the non-philosophy of philosophy, which one looks into that, then the person tries to see the network between knowledge, non- and anti-knowledge. How these three things can come together to produce, as I said, the fragile center of understanding. This is one of the reasons, one of the ways of also quest responding to the question about fluctuations of certainty.
We will talk about this much more as I bring non-philosophy into my discussion later. Yeah. Yes, sir. Sir, uh, sir uh, this is Albert speaking. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, sir, moving on to the primordial philosopher, uh, considering Aristotelian philosophical thinking of the ideas or structures in the celestial celestial world and the earthly realm, what will be the role of the membranic thinking considering either the rigidity or the lucidity of traversing from the ethereal world to the temporal world or vice versa if possible since we start from a structure since we always start from a structure or there is a temptation to start from structure what will be the role of this membranic thinking uh, uh, um, that puts me in a spin here because um, <laughs> i actually never thought I, I didn't think about that because this is a very as you said it is a deeply primordial question because uh, um aristotle um well aristotle talks about uh structuring aristotle talks about uh, very interesting ideas about bronze in his book the metaphysics um uh, but uh, i think uh, uh connecting aristotle with uh, the membranic thinking that I mentioned would read a far more post Aristotelian ideas. Uh, I mean, there's, it would be a, a lot of extending Aristotle uh, beyond what the, the way he thought of things, because uh, mm, the membranic thinking that I'm talking about is primarily something that starts to challenge this productionist metaphysics of understanding. If you go by Heidegger, uh, this this productionist metaphysics of understanding is what Aristotle basically is. Uh, something belongs to and something that I have been challenging. Or rather, I shouldn't say challenging. I'm trying to revise my understanding of. So uh, this question probably is too expansive at this moment to take on, because in that case, I have to discuss with you Aristotle on form, uh, Aristotle and structure, and then move on to see how I look at membranic thinking. So maybe uh, sometime later we can pick this up. Yeah. Yes, sir. Thank you, yeah. sir. Well, it was intriguing me. That's why. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes.